So there are, dif there are different types of MI. We can categorize into first one is spontaneous myocardial infarction. Second one is myocardial infarction, secondary to ischemia. Third one is sudden cardiac death lacking biomarkers, good ECG evidence associated with coronary stenting or angioplasty. And the fifth one is MI associated with CAVG. The common one that we use to get, uh, categorize the ACS is unstable angina. Stable angina, unstable angina, STEMI, non, and non-STEMI, which we can see uh, the differences between the different types of ACS. Lah. So proceed to the next one. How ACS happens? So in most cases, this results from coronary artery disease uh, and it is initiated by the rupture of or erosion of a plug within the coronary artery, causing acute thrombosis within the vessels, often with hemorrhagic extension mm -hmm. in the atherosclerotic plug, contraction of smooth muscle cells within the artery wall, resulting in vessel constriction that reduce the lumen diameter of the artery. So these were associated with partial or complete obstruction of the lumen, often with embolism of thrombus into the distal part of the vessels and results in sudden and critical reduction of blood flow to myocardium. So less oxygen supply to the uh, myocardium. So the one that we use for risk stratification that commonly used in our ED setting is heart score and TIMI score for USA and also non-STEMI and KILIP classification for STEMI. So different, different scoring uh, are used to see what's the risk. Now. So for heart score is uh, to see major cardiac event over the next six weeks. So score zero to three is 2.5% uh, can be discharged home. Four to six is 20.3% which needs uh, emission for clinical observation. And score 7 to 10 is 72.7% of major cardiac events over the next six weeks that require early invasive strategies. So the one, uh, the criteria information that need to know for the heart score is history, ECG changes, age, risk, uh, risk factor, and also uh, troponin. So TIMI score is to see the mortality new or recurrent MI of severe recurrent ischemia requiring urgent revascularization through 14 days after uh, the visit. So the one that we use uh, age, which is more than 65, more than three risk factors for coronary artery disease, use of ASA, known uh, coronary artery disease, prior stenosis, more than 50%, more than one episode of rest angina, less than 24 hours, ST segment deviation, and elevated cardiac markers. And then KILIP classification is to see the risk of development of the heart failure. So class ones, uh, there's no evidence of heart failure, which the mortality is 6%. And class two, mild to moderate heart failure, you can see S3 gallop, uh, rails less than halfway up lung fields or elevated JVP. And class three is uh, evidence of pulmonary edema, which the mortality is 38%. Class four, which has cardiogenic shock, defined as SPP less than 90 millimeter mercury. So, and also signs of hypoperfusion, oliguria, Cyanosis and swelling, the mortality is up to 67%. So diagnosis of STEMI is based on the presence of evolution changes of ST elevation in resting ECG and history of ischemic type chest pain or its equivalent supported by a rise or fall in the cardiac biomarkers. 
But usually in ED setting, we, we won't wait for the cardiac markers to present if there's evidence of the ischemic type uh, chest pain and also ECG ST elevation, we will proceed uh, a treat as a STEMI. So history, this, uh, this is the re research study that shows uh, how many percentage of patients with ACS come with the uh, likelihood of the symptoms. So the first one is the chest pain radiating up to the right arms or shoulder and followed by radiation to both arms or shoulder associated with exertion, radiation to left arm associated with diaphoresis, associated with nausea or vomiting, worse than previous angina or similar to previous MI and described as pressure. So, uh, and then the rest is the decreased likelihood of uh, ACS. Now. So ECG manifestation, which uh, we can say ST elevation, new ST elevation at the J point in two contiguous leads with the cut points. More than 0 0.1 millivolt in all leads other than lead B2 and B2 to B3. And more than or equal to 0 0.2 millivolt in men, more than 40 years. More than 0 0.25 millivolt in men, less than 40 years or more than 0 0.15 nivot in women in lead B2 to B3. So the cutoff point for ST segment elevation in posterior leads is more than 0 0.05 millivolt. Or uh, we can say uh, more than 0 0.1 millivolt in men less than uh, 40 years old. So other than the ST elevation, most of the cases we can see uh, reciprocal changes in the ECG also, which uh, we can see Following by the followed by the mnemonic slap pills. So P A I L S, you just follow P is for posterior, A for anterior, I is for inferior, L for lateral, S is septal. So if there's ECG uh, ST elevation in P, this is posterior, we can see reciprocal changes in A. A is the anterior. So uh, follow the sequence and for the septal, the reciprocal changes we can see it in P posterior. So, other than that, we also need to take note that patient presented with new uh, bundle block uh, BBB. So, uh, com comparison with previous ECG may be helpful. So, a new LBBB we treat as a STEMI. Okay. So, if the initial ECG is non diagnostic and index of substitution of STEMI is high, the ECG should be repeated uh, within like next 15 minutes to look for any progressive ST changes and compare with previous ECG, whether got any dynamic changes and additional chest leads uh, V7 to 9 and right ventricular leads should be done to identify posterior and right ventricular infarcts. So before we proceed to the ST elevation, we need to know the normal ECG. Lah. This is the normal ECG. Then this, we can see the ST elevations. Okay. So different leads uh, presented with ST elevations can show where's the location of the infarct, such as for V1 to V3 is anteroceptor. V1 to V6 is extensive anterior. V7 to V8 is posterior. V1 to V2, Posterior, which uh, in the case we saw, we see ST depression and tall R wave in V1 to V2. We need to be alert because we need a, to do a posterior ECG to see, to see whether it's a posterior infarct or not. And then one AVL V5 V6 shows anterolaterals. Two, three AVF is inferior. V4 R is right ventricular infarct. So from the site uh, of myocardial area affected, we can know where's the possible occluded artery. For septal, uh, most likely is from the proximal LAD, anterior LAD, apical, uh, it can be the distal LAD left or left circumflex or RCA. For lateral is circumflex, inferior is RCA, likely 90% uh, is from the RCA, and 
10% from circumflex. Some posterior lateral also uh, referred to as posterior or inferior basal. So RCA or circumflex. The investigation that we need to do to see whether there's uh, evidence of uh, infarct. So CKMB, trop I, trop T, and CK. The one that commonly used in our ED setting is trop I, lah, which first detection can be seen in within three to four hours, and duration of detection is seven to ten days. And we use uh, high sensitivity trop I because uh, the sensitivity and the specificity is the highest. Lah. And just now I mentioned already, we should not wait for the results of these biomarkers before initiating uh, the reperfusion therapy if we see there's a ST elevation changes and also patient presented with typical signs and symptoms of uh, stamina. So other diagnosis modalities, uh, we can use the which we can see new uh, regional motion abnormalities, LV, RV function, and mechanical complications of acute MI, example, free wall rupture, acute ventricular septal defects, and mitral regurgitation. Okay. So what is STEMI equivalent? STEMI equivalence means that the ECG changes doesn't really show uh, ST, obvious ST elevation, but we need as STEMI. So one is for the first one is first like no, uh, diagonal branch of the left anterior descending atrium. In the first diagonal branch, uh, which we call D1 of the LAD supplies blood to the anterior lateral wall of the left ventricular. So uh, we need to look for ST elevation in AVL and also V2. So upright T wave and AVL and V2 and ST depression and inverted T wave in inferior leads uh, 3 and ABF. So this one didn't really follow the, uh, the rest of the changes. So we uh, need to take note of the STEMI equivalent. So for example, this is the changes that we can see. And the winter's T wave. So concerning for proximal LED occlusion presented is 2% of the patients. So looking for upsloping ST depression at J points in lead V1 to V4 without ST elevation. T wave in lead V1 to V4 and ST elevation in lead AVR plus minus AVR. So this one, V1 to V4, there's upsloping. And left main coronary artery stenosis, uh, we need to look for ST elevation in AVR and uh, widespread ST depression. So in the ST, uh, ST depression in lead 1, 2, and V4 to V6 plus ST elevation in AVR presented in 90% of the patients with greater than 70% stenosis of the left main uh, coronary artery stenosis. So this is the example of the left main uh, coronary artery stenosis. Proceed for the next one. And next one is Wellen syndrome. Uh, we need to be alert because uh, Wellen syndrome can have active or recent angina chest pain, but have a minimal or pathologic, uh, um, minimal or no cardiac biomarkers elevation, absence of pathologic precordial Q wave, minimal or lack of ST elevation less than one millimeter. No loss of uh, precordial R wave progression and characteristic of T wave abnormalities. So this one is mostly people will miss uh, Wellen syndrome. So there's two types of Wellen syndrome. Type A, uh, which is 25% of the cases, consists of biphasic T wave. Type B, which 75% uh, of the cases presented with type B, which consists of deep symmetric T waves. Can see from uh, the pictures shown be, uh, after that. So for Wellen syndrome, provocative stress test could be proved to have consequences resulting in acute myocardial infarction and fatal dysarrhythmias. 
So AMI can occur within a mean of six to eight point five days after emission, but a mean of thirty one point four days. After this is from one of the studies that we got lah. Key ways changes may be transient or resolved with medical management. So we need to really look for deep inverted P waves in the uh, V1 to V4 or biphasic T wave in this V1 to V4. Don't miss valence syndrome. So example of valence type A, biphasic T and deep T for valence type B from in V1 to V4. And the posterior wall uh, microdeck infrastructure, I think uh, I already mentioned before. If you see a question in leads V1 to V3, uh, don't forget to do a posterior lead stuff. Uh, you might see a ST elevation in posterior lead stuff. So, this is an example of the normal ECG that we use. Uh, we do during the posterior stem mine. You can see V1 to V3, there's ST depression. But when we, when we do with posterior leads, the 7, 8, 9, we can see ST elevation. So don't miss out this uh, posterior stem. So how do we do the uh, posterior lead uh, ECG is uh, following the pictures, which from the scapula, the tip of the scapula, we will that's the location of the V8. Then subsequently V7 and V8. So the next one, clinical botulinum is, it is important to recognize the above five patterns as these are high risk of ACS patients because the significant portion of the left ventricle is at jeopardy. So only set four of the above diagnosis require activation of the cath lab immediately and the fifth one requires consultation of interventional uh, cardiology. So for management part, last time uh, when we say management for STEMI, uh, we will say uh, pneumonia is born up. So, but now uh, we change already because from, uh, we proceed first with uh, pre-hospital management, which, where, which we know, need to know is time of the myocardium impact. The public should be educated. Pre care, uh, what we can provide for in the pre-hospital care and uh, suspected stemming should be given a uh, soluble, chewable uh, 300 mg aspirin and 300 mg propidogrel. So for the management part, early management of stemming is uh, directed at pain relief, establish early reperfusion, treatment of complications. And choice of reperfusion uh, depends on the time of onset of symptoms of the uh, stemming diagnosis and contraindication of the fibrinolysis and also uh, what uh, the patient is it in high risk groups or not. So why we didn't like uh, give regular morphine for every patient already? Because from the study, uh, actually we noticed that morphine decreased the corpidogrel concentration and effects uh, randomized and complete the blinded placebo control trial shows this stuff. So in acute MI, uh, IV morphine should be available if patient doesn't have any uh, symptoms of uh, unacceptable level of the pain. So if uh, we give morphine uh, sulfate in, at an initial dose of 2 to 4 mg with increment to 2 to 8 mg repeatedly at 5 to 15 minutes interval, can be, do if, uh, can be done if patients complain of severe pain. But if the use we will minimize the use of morphine now. So uh, oxygen-wise, actually, uh, this one, we didn't really uh, every patient with uh, STEMI already. So from this study, actually, uh, they compared the patients within, uh, which we provided for oxygen and the oxygen. Actually, conclude that routine use of supplement oxygen in patients with su suspected myocardial infarction who do not have hypoxemia was not found to reduce the one year all cost mortality. So, there's no evidence that this will benefit the patient. We, we will give the patients with uh, oxygen unless the saturation is below than. Uh, it's safe to give also uh, if below than 95%.
if patients came with like uh, chest pain or chest pain equivalent, what we need is continuous ECG monitoring, sublingual GTN, aspirin, topidogrel, uh, and analgesia, oxygen if oxygen saturation is less than 95%. So uh, this, we will decide on giving aspirin, topidogrel, and also uh, the rest depends on the heart score. Those of uh, chest pain, we won't regularly uh, give first, but if moderate risk, and um, we can start it first before the uh, waiting for the troponin, uh, the biomarkers to come up. So, if less than three hours, uh, suggested primary PCI of therapy. three to 12 hours is primary PCI, more than 12 hours is medical therapy, plus minus anti thrombotics. So uh, consider PCI within three to 24 hours if fibrinolytics are administered as part of the pharmacoinvasive strategy. And for PCI, if ongoing ischemia or hemodynamically unstable patients. And other concomitant therapy is anti uh, double antiplatelet therapy, statin, beta blockers, is, uh, is inhibitors, ARBS, and MRA. So for primary PCI, the target from first uh, contact to wire crossing, or we call door to balloon time, the one in PCI, uh, the one that the hospital got PCI uh, facilities is within 90 minutes. If there's non-PCI capable hospital, is within 120 other uh, hospital facilities that have uh, PCI. So uh, it comes on set to door one, which is emergency department. It, uh, then door one is uh, what we call the first medical contact. Should be less than 10 minutes. And So when patient arrive to ED, it should be triage to fast lane, which uh, if there's STA patients, put patients in with SARS. And then ECG interpretation should be less than 10 minutes, not more than 10 minutes. And then time in the ED supposed to be less than 30 minutes. And if there's no PCI in the hospital, the time to the ED that has uh, PCI is less than 60 minutes. So, uh, which is door two. In door two, which is the next uh, ED facilities that have PCI, less than 30 minutes to uh, ED to PCI. Okay. So, for, for fibrinolysis, if transfer time to PCI is capable hospital is prolonged, fibrinolysis is advised. So what we mentioned is uh, less than 90 minutes and also 120 minutes. So if it's more than that, then it's uh, advisable to give fibrinolysis, uh, not delay uh, fibrinolysis. Huh? So the commonly, the widely used uh, fibrinolytic therapy is uh, streptokinase, which is non-fibrin specific, lower patency rate of vessels at 60 minutes than fibrin specific agents, Antigenic, uh, which promotes production of antibodies. And also uh, the regime is 1.5 mega units in 100 mils, uh, normal slide over one hour. And the next uh, therapy, the agent that we commonly use is uh, metalase or solar uh, connector place. So this is uh, fibrin specific agents, which rapid repercussion of occluded artery than uh, streptokinase. And it's given in the and weight based uh, depends on the graph uh, provided. So what is the contraindication? Uh, there's absolute and relative uh, contraindications. For, so I focus on the absolute risk. Uh, one of the risks is risk of intracranial hemorrhage, which has patient has history of intracranial bleed, ischemic stroke within three months, no structural uh, cerebral vascular lesions, non intracranial neoplasms, and uh, other risks of bleeds, such as active bleeding or bleeding uh, diathesis, bleeding menses, 
uh, significant head trauma within three months and suspected aortic dissection. Uh. So this type of patients, uh, we need to be alert and is contraindicated to give uh, fibrinolytic therapy. Uh. So how do we know that we successful, uh, the treatment is successful or not? So actually there's no sensitive bedside clinical methods to uh, reliable, uh, that is reliable to detect successful reperfusion. But guidelines shows that uh, early return of ST segment elevation to isoelectric line or decrease in 50% of the height of the ST elevation uh, shows uh, successful fibrinolytic therapy. Lah. So that's all. And we need to take note that the occurrence of the reperfusion and thermias uh, is not a reliable indicator. And exception is uh, accelerate idioventricular idio rhythm and sudden sinus bradycardia, which have been correlated with patent infarct related coronary artery after fibrinolytic therapy or primary PCI. So the, those that failed fibrinolysis will need a rescue PCI. Okay. Then after that, we can proceed with the uh, STEMI TIMI risk call uh, to predict the 30 days mortality. So when 0, 0 to 14 uh, plausible points shows a moderate and low risk, but five points and below shows a less than 12% risk of uh, 30 days mortality. And for high risk, it's six, six points and above uh, 16 to percent of uh, risk of 30 days mortality. So what is my STEMI network? We need to be familiar with my STEMI network in our... So you can see the round one, the bullet one is the facilities with PCI. The square one is the one that non-PCI capable uh, hospital. So if there's no uh, center, they will direct to the nearest PCI uh, hospital. So you can see, uh, for example, our hospital uh, is the square one, which is non-PCI capable. The facilities that we can send to is UITM, the nearest one. Uh, uh. So for hospital square below, you can see the square one, uh, non PCI capable center. Uh, the nearest PCI, uh, the PCI capable center is UITM. And then for hospital Salaya, also same. Nearest is UITM, they can send to UITM or IGN. And for HKL and Hospital Ampa is uh, nearest one is IJN. Or Hospital Ampa can also send to PP, uh, PPUM. You can see it follow like that. Lah. So like uh, UMMC is the one PCI capable. So Hospital Shalom and Hospital Clan can send to UMMC, the nearest one. Uh, so this is my STEMI network in Selangor. Okay, understand? So uh, the time interval that I already discussed just now, this is the summary. It's easier to understand. Okay, okay thank you. This is our reference. Any Check in which you actually cover, I think, almost all. Um, you cover almost all the um, things that you need, Okay, a majority you have already covered, uh, I think, all uh, that you need to know. Very And even if you are not so sure, you can refer back to the presentation um, because uh, you also cover the um, uh, equi STEMI equivalent. Okay, uh, so sebelum um, I give some feedback, probably the master student, FCAM student, and also the specialist. Any anything that you want to add? Afis, yang Shamini. I thought this slide on standing is 
Just a bit, really. I'm just like, yeah. So I think you already cover a lot on STEMI equivalence. I just a bit only I just cover a bit of STEMI mimics actually. So because sometimes we do get patients that looks like an MI, but it's actually not MI. What do you make it? Presentation. Uh, right. Just a bit, and I cover about five minutes only. So, so we got a mnemonic actually. We can use the mnemonic elevation either electrolyte, which is your hyperkalemia, followed by LFBBB, early deposition, which is your BER, ventricle hypertrophy, LV aneurysm, whether Takasabu or maybe your ICH or information or spawn wave. So I just cover a bit on semi mimics. The next slide. Where's the gear? I can go. Where's the gear? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So a bit about this is, for example, this ECG. What do you actually look at? Maybe someone can have the answer. Lisa? If you look at this ECG, this. Uh -oh. It's a sinus rhythm, but the most obvious thing is the tall T wave. Yes. Yeah. So if you can see, if in hyperkalemic changes, color of my hyperkalemic 5.5 to 6.5, you have a very tall T wave, right? You can look like an ST elevation, but then you will never have tall T wave dekat, even yeah, tall T wave dekat, we lead one and so ABL. So this is one of the ECG mimics. So if let's say hyperkalemia more than 6.5, you can see the PR interval can prolong, subsequent loss of the P wave, followed by a very broad QRS. So this is explanation by B. So how about this? Anyone else want to answer? It's a 25 years old. We usually we get this ECG. Yeah. It's a very, very common presentation. We have very like right sided chest pain patient, very young male patient, some with chest pain. Yeah. Yeah, it's BR. Why is the reason it's called BR? The lead to and lead to. Yeah. So we are usually they have like a very concave ST elevation. You see the very concave ST elevation. You can, you can see like this notch here. The best part is they start the RV progression dia normal. But I think MI and interceptal MI punya, you have poor RV progression. That's one of the BER changes. And they don't reciprocal changes. Okay, but for BER, it's actually a diagnosis of exclusion. Then there was BER, you still have to think about other things. The next. Okay, how about this? This common, I think last month, we have seen also during my team on call night shift. I think Jimmy can answer. I think Jimmy has seen this case. <laughs> because this is patient in recent MI. What do you think of? So what do you see the ECG here? It's a bifacic inversion. Okay. But you can see there's a deep QRS. I think the deep, sorry, deep Q wave. You can see deep Q wave. So this patient having LV aneurysm, you actually can use a scoring for TQRS ratio scoring, whether it's less than 0 0.36. So if you see the TQRS ratio there, the T ini ke sini, lima saja, bisa 18. So the ratio is about 0 0.6, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So this one is, can be LV aneurysm. It looks like a vellum, but actually not a vellum. So you can call it with the history and also by echo. So this is LV aneurysm. If let's say that MI occur like an inferior, then you can see the Q wave and bifacy like an inferior leads. Valent to the Q, yes. So this is diagnosis of exclusion also, but you can use an echo. You can see it's like a, an LV that can very, very looks like aneurysm, like Takasobo like that. 
you can see from the echo. Okay, next. How about this? These are common first year question actually. Very good like this, yes. Because you can see here. Uh, widespread ST elevation. With PR depression, except for in AVR. AVR is terbalik. The PR elevation with ST depression. That's very good like this. And sporadic sign is? What the sporadic sign is? If you look at it too, ni, sporadic sign meaning down sloping from your P to P wave. That's called sporadic sign. So how? Uh, it is pericarditis. So how about this? We see a widespread T inversion then. Yeah, widespread T inversion. So in patient with uh, ICB, right? ICB, the catecholamine surge, then tiba-tiba sympathetic response, BP will go up. So your keratin, aortic arch too, I can detect a bioreceptor. Mm -hmm. So that's parasympathetic activated. So that's called Brady. So that's very, very widespread, like very large T wave, but very small QRS. Mm -hmm. So this is can be seen in your patient with either ICB. Yeah, so if I say different neurosurgical, sometimes they say why the ECG changes can be, can be ACS, no. It is due to the bleed itself. Okay. So how about this? This one actually an FRCAM question. Primary, secondary, at intermediate question. So this one can be seen in, this is, what wave is this? Oh, it's Osborne wave. wave. Yes, it's an Osborne wave. Similar to hypercalcemia uh, as well, they have a very, very sharp uh, QT interval, if you see. It looks like an MI, can? Yeah, just simple sharing. Huh? Okay, that's all. Okay, but at least it's just in the brain, seeing all those uh, variety of ECGs. Eh? Um, okay, good. Thank you, Charlie. Um, you're right, Hafiz, Swami, and other Afghan, Afghan Rama, I haven't said that. Any other things to be added? Or something for Randy? Right, any questions? Or you want to add? Yeah, Lisa? The patient walked running into three acts. And you can also see his chest pain. Huh? But the VP, uh, I mean, I'm just sharing from my recent experience. A gentleman came in diaphragmatic, complaining of his skin and chest pain. Um, all other vitals are okay except for the blood pressure is 80 over 40. Is it fair enough for us to catch to your ITM? Um, because like to, to shorten the door to the to time or we should I mean I mean the ECG is already done is it? no the ECG is not done but I mean highly suspecting am I well um job for the line sketch on COVID uh it's it's very challenging um uh, questions um <laughs> okay. All right. Um, well, uh, from here to I think it's very, very real, right? But we have our resuscitation as well, resuscitation zone, which is um, can cater for COVID and COVID. Basically, our emergency department is um, hybrid line, although we are the full COVID hospital, but we are hybrid hospital. We are hybrid hospital. So the cases which is um, um, unstable, 80 over 50 is definitely, 80 over 40 is definitely um, not stable condition, unless our research to memang tutup, tutup lah. Right, so for this patient, basically, um, uh, we have to triage to our red zone first. Um, in view of, because we are able to provide um, transport which is quite, um, quite near lah. And I remember door to needle time is actually 30 minutes and actually uh, door to balloon time is 90 minutes for um, balloon capability lah. Sebenarnya kita bukan, tapi we can consider ourselves because 90 minutes is actually 
is very ample time. Um, the issue is that two vendor, eh, dua vendor, number one is actually um, the COVID thing lah. Uh, as you know, kita dah ada RTK kan? Uh, RTK um, swap that we do at the bedside. It can be done very fast. Number two, um, which is still a bit to read um, regarding the payment. Uh, I wish that yang sebelah tu is actually like MDN or something like that. Tapi sebab unfortunately is a university because they have their own um, um, rules and regulation. But uh, please don't make that as an absolute restriction. Because um, at the moment, uh, as of COVID, um, they are most likely they are still covering for financial, but I'm not so sure until when. Um, so it's the best that we do an ECG in our place first, and then provide all the very very um, vital uh, medication before we actually communicate. Because kalau hantar kat sana pun dah ada stop dekat EG sana investigate. So kalau dari sini pun sama je sebenarnya. Uh, what we do, we are bagi certain investigation and then talk to them. And then bukan kita hantar ke EG, kita terus hantar ke lab. So sebenarnya sama, dia singgah kat EG sini. Lepas tu kalau tak, dia terus pergi sana, dia kena EG kat sana. And um, I think our EG is more, um, in that sense, more efficient dari segi treatment, kita ada enough stuff, um, monitoring, all that. So sebenarnya sama sini punya ED dan sana punya ED. So we stop here, we manage here and then we refer over there lah. That is what we, we can do. Uh, but as of now, um, maybe one or two cases that you will notice lah eh. Sebenarnya kita ada PAC bypass pun. Okay, tapi PAC bypass ni sebenarnya go through pakar. Because we need to alert our team dekat sana to get prepared. Because um, these are the patients yang bukan terus pergi PCI, sebenarnya dia akan kena ED sana dulu. Yeah, untuk take all the vital signs. So that one we also uh, do, I think quite a few times already because um, our PHC is very efficient and also the communication between us and also ED dekat sana is very, very closely related because they are the one who worked here before and we are in the same WhatsApp group of STEMI network. Right, so yang itu pun kita ada buat. Uh, that's why we are training the uh, paramedic to learn how to read ECG, and don't be surprised that some of them can even read the ECG a lot better than some of the housemans and also in person. Um, the recent ALS has proved that. Okay, all right. Um, uh, the other one is that um, for administrative issues. Um, if you know that uh, kita ada KPI, eh? KPI yang telah termaktub di mana the P-Hospital Care has to start the aspirin in the suspected ACS cases. Um, so, um, um, dia punya level is actually 65%. 65% of cases of the PHC that they suspect ACS has to be given aspirin before arrival to our emergency department. So, um, kita ada some issues in that sense because um, not all cases are being responded by our PHC ambulance. Yeah, walaupun MECC kita cover sampai hujung Bukit Tangkar semua tu ya, eh, even sampai ke Sebadan Perak, tapi uh, kita tak semestinya respond. Yeah, call taker is us, but the responding is other teams. So the issues with the responding team, other responding team will fall under our um, KPI. So um, kita ada a few months yang kita tak tercapai but of course it will be good if you can give it back especially key case kan bila dia hantar case dia under kita so dia hantar the, the statistic will fall under us juga lah right so kalau tak bagi aspirin tu please bagi dia orang feedback lah because some of them are not really proactive or some of them are really don't get the access for the information alright um, sorry sebelum tu um Jasmine, so ada nak tambah apa-apa tak? It's now uh, do mention about reperfusion arrhythmia. Right? What do you all understand about that? Anyone can respect tahu that statement kan, do good kan, tapi tak ada orang tanya soalan kan. Okay. 
maybe the masters or Afghan can answer. Ah, Dr. Subayi kat satu tu. Randy selalu Oh, so kena panggil Randy juga. Kan? Isi hati Randy. <laughs> Uh, because I spend time thrombolysis, and then right after thrombolysis, too, they have a, uh, usually one or two minutes after thrombolysis, the patient will have uh, abnormal rhythm. Um, most of the time, uh, it's either VT, ataupun um, VT, like in Slato. The worst complication we have, the patient might be with BF. Huh? Ataupun ini just a short run VT ataupun The one that commonly see is short run VT lah After the Femininotic uh, therapy given Then they have short run VT but The one we no need to be like so So nervous about it because it's a reperfusion arrhythmia So continue monitoring first then we see We see how is it done the They proceed how is it I, I think yang last week ada kot yang eh, uh, Yesterday, two days ago, yang saya hantar IJN Yang ada case of Untuk we develop VT after thrombolysis Yes, so but tadi I worry about look at that, uh, we don't really have to do anything much. Then yeah, you, you need to have that everything in you juga eh. <laughs> because especially the MPA MI again, so we really think about the short run VT so it's good that you, you alert. Tapi you need to have the knowledge lah, so you nak terus uh, synchronize kan you put ke or CPR or something like that. But it's good for you to, jangan lah macam uh, short run VT, okay continue. <laughs> Right, so as what well, so mentioned, you, you still have to alert yourself, but the knowledge has to be there for you to differentiate between is it like a reperfusion, uh, uh, or because of the another type of, uh, or you need to do um, maybe uh, rescue PCI or something like that. Yeah, okay. Yes, uh, Scabosa criteria. Uh, I think I already know about modified Scabosa, right? Uh, so, as you know, the specificity is very high, but the sensitivity is quite low. So, the latest in our MI world is actually Barcelona criteria. I don't know whether you all have heard about it. It's now the latest uh, criteria, but it's not really used in exam. La. It's good to know. Especially our masters, ada kemungkinan dia akan tanya pasal Barcelona criteria. Uh, the only difference uh, dengan modified scabosa dengan Barcelona criteria actually you tengok sama je just that the component ST depression kalau you tengok modified scabosa they say B1 to B3 tapi kalau you tengok Barcelona they say in any leads and if you see the sensitivity and the specificity is quite high lah but bila you baca Barcelona punya uh, the, the journal it kind of shows that any LDBB that comes to you, you literally have to suspect as MI. And they, they thrombolize our goal for primary PCI now because they say uh, most of us, what we tend to do when we see a LDBB, we will assume that it's an old changes or we say, oh, it's a previous MI. So we don't take action on it. So those patients in that journey, what they did was they did a PCI and found out actually the patient is memang having MI. So it's a miss. Uh, I would say it's a miss and my la. So read a bit on Barcelona criteria la. So far I think maybe in the future That might be the criteria That is being used uh, At the moment uh, I think still Masih dalam study punya thing. Tak, tak really guna but I think for masters mungkin dia akan Tanya dekat exam And dekat exam you tak ada tanya direct ST elevation and my lah Dia akan bagi yang pelik-pelik Atau yang apa yang Syamil tunjuk Atau macam kita punya exam ada Kita lah, benda-benda lain yang keluar 
or sport way, those kind of things. Uh, they don't ask you very basic stuff. Uh, these are for masters. So usually dalam Viva ataupun um, dalam Anmen Oski uh, ACLS, memang akan keluar lah, ya, yeah? uh, 100%. Um, anything else? Um, cuma tadi saya cari Dr. Umar. Sebab in the, the presentation, uh, ada sikit yang tak cover, I think how to diagnose through ultrasound sebenarnya. Because it's very, very, very uh, in, yeah, important is the other thing. It's very, very easy and very fast at the bedside. Especially um, those yang history dia macam sure tak sure dia kita panggil word if if and then ECG kan sebenarnya banyak ECG kalau you selalu tengok ECG very fast you nak diagnose tapi kadang-kadang jarang jumpa you pun tak sure sure tak sure tak sure, tak sure. so the other tools that we have is a bit track ultrasound so umur less than five minutes how do we use uh, ultrasound to diagnose um, MI Remember, ultrasound is not the only tool. History, physical examination, investigation, ECG, chop uh, eye, lambat dan nak balik kan? Um, so, ultrasound is very fast at the right side. Assalamualaikum. Selamat pagi semua. Um, okay, so um, as what Dr. Siti Sue has already mentioned, ultrasound is not the, um, not the, the tool for you to diagnose your MI. Right? It's an adjunct tool that you can use as, a, as um, it's an adjunct bedside um, investigation. So the ladies incorporate your physical examination, ECG, and cardiac biomarkers together with your ultrasound in order to make um, a definitive diagnosis. So um, ultrasound is very useful because you can uh, literally um, uh, differentiate between uh, NMI or uh, NMI mimics. Right? Um, and at the same time, um, ECG echo cardiography can actually be used in order for you to locate um, which part of the um, which part of the ventricular function that is impacted. And so you can incorporate your um, echo cardiography with your ECG. So let's say if you get someone with an ST elevation over the uh, two G A B F and reciprocal changes so over the one A D L and B two B three B four. So your expected um, echocardiographic finding would be hypokinesia and over the inferior and posterior wall. And so what you need to look for is actually hypokinesia. And so um, so sorry, kalau kalau ada more kan hypokinesia kan sebenarnya akan berada di um, <coughs> The uh, parastomal short axis, short axis view. So that's the most sensitive um, view that you want to determine um, regional wall abnormality. Huh? So parastomal long axis, parastomal short axis view, and uh, mid papillary view. Huh? So from there, you'll be able to see um, your hypokinesia. Huh? Maksud hypokinesia tu lah pergerakan um, myocardium tu. Huh? Dia um, hypokinetic as compared to the other regions of the left ventricle. Yeah? Yeah. So let's say if you get someone with um, deep Q wave, yeah? deep Q wave, the kind you put your precordial leads or you put in your um, limb leads. Yeah? And based on history, patient, patients, patient have had um, an MI and been thrombolized. And, and you would still see uh, hypokinesia, you would still see reading wall abnormality, uh, but if it's a long protracted at the womb and the lamina, what you're going to be seeing adalah echinacea. So echinacea, thin wall, uh, if you see echinacea, thin wall, at that particular region of the uh, myocardium, so it means that it's an old MI, but it's infected and it's uh, um, yeah, yeah, it's infected. And so what you're going to be seeing is um, thin wall and akinetic. In contrast to a new MI, so the myocardium is still uh, thick, ataupun uh, data, data nipis, yeah? then it's hypokinetic. 
So that's how you differentiate. Um, bear in mind that um, uh, echocardiography can also um, rule out other causes that can uh, mimic um, MI in, in an ECG. For instance, um, aortic dissection. No, for all, um, everyone knows that you know, for patients who have aortic dissection, so the most typical findings, ECG findings would be um, ST elevation over the inferior leads. Yeah. So when you, whenever you get someone with um, inferior MI on your ECG, always have a look at the myocardium and the aorta as well. Yes. Here we um, go. Just five minutes. The other thing that you need to rule out, you know, rule out is actually that you need to get any reason to that. Yeah, we will let you know. Especially when you're four chamber, four chamber view, right? Eh? So we're not any reason too is something like contraindicated for a strep. Kan? So those two you will let exclude. So but dulu zaman zaman jadi lah zaman saya tu sebenarnya ada sangat tak ada. So it's a must to do chest X-ray. But macam macam chest X-ray tu boleh dah ingat um, dah setting any reason kan? And also why the media standard that's the reason why. So kalau ada orang kata must, especially your clinic, your best clinic dekat medical kan? Kenapa tak buat uh, chest X-ray sebelum that you can just look at them like okay that was 10 years ago, <laughs> right? Um, and then believe me, whatever being diagnosed, many uh, at this moment of time, masih lagi medical MO tu banyak yang yang boleh dipakai lain juga. Tapi sekarang kita dah pulang dah kali. So please don't be, don't feel inferior towards them. Even though they are medical MO, they bagi decision yang boleh pelik tu. Uh, to me, your knowledge is a lot better. And the other thing is that uh, to be in emergency emergency department is a privilege because dulu zaman dulu dulu eh. Uh, emergency MO tu yang paling kurang efisien lah sebab all cases refer kan macam traffic light tak treat pun zaman saya dulu masa zaman saya houseman dekat Nishtar tu you are not allowed to treat refer 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 strap tu memang tak start tapi now being in emergency department um, as why I want to quote Datuk Christopher you pernah kenal eh? Datuk Christopher D the best MO should be in ED because if we have the best MO in ED it will Reduce the burden of other departments in the wards, but that is not the reason to delay for them to come down and review the patients because they know that we can do a lot of things. Yeah, after COVID, ni they don't tell you don't need ICU. That is the disadvantage they take for granted. But again, um, uh, believe me, whatever is being missed by you all, most likely they will miss as well. So we are the first person to need to know all the iffy iffy ECGs and understand the mimic like. Uh, the differential analysis of ST elevation and then sometimes bila you dah tengok banyak actually you screen a lot than them kan yeah so sometimes you rasa macam oh okay kenapa tak buat sesi sini so basically uh, uh, remember that you have seen more than them only maybe about 30 percent the cases that you see you refer the rest actually you observe here ataupun uh, kita discharge terus kan but not definitely ACS is not one of them lah okay so um, please be confident of yourself and most important is actually please equip yourself with the vital knowledge so that our patient don't die when we discharge lah. To suggest, yeah? Whatever it is, banyak differential diagnosis yang non um, life threatening, our uh, thoughts, yeah? our line of thought should always be prioritized the life threatening first. Yeah? It's okay to have BER, but your mind is actually is MI to do. Yeah? You look, of course, you need to go out. Right? It's a diagnosis of exclusion. Okay, I have a meeting, but I just not remind my mate. Um, sorry, yeah, sketch up just a minute. I was told Papa take over. Uh, that's the same to talk as I said, but then I can Um, number one is actually the SKT line. Uh, SKT, I hope you all the hunter to the Tishima, the video date is actually like you have Okay. So uh, SKT tu, um, dia lain ni eh, SKT and LMPT So before you all hantar LMPT, sebenarnya ada maybe you all bila nak tekan bata LMPT tu tak boleh hantar Tak boleh hantar, reason thing, you all punya SKT you all tak complete kan During the early of the years, memang you all isi SKT you all hantar But throughout the end of the year, you kena complete kan SKT which means that you tulis dalam ruangan 100% Tak ada, tak ada langsung kotak kosong Ya, yeah, even though you hantar, Dr. Shima dah um, sahkan Tapi you see tak boleh hantar because bila you buka balik your SKT ada ruangan yang tak tulis kosong on tercapai berapa persen So, complete kan SKT, hantar dulu tu uh, Dr. Shima dia sahkan baru you boleh hantar your LMPT lah 
Okay, so some of you all mungkin tak perlu hantar NMPT if you are less than four months in our ED. Yeah, for master students, some of you all kena hantar ke uh, bahagian um, apa, BPL. Uh, but otherwise, please send quite fast because your even though the latest date is 30th of October, tapi if possible, hantar awal lah so that we can send early to the PPK. PPK is pegawai okay. penilai kedua, which is me lah. Okay, so maybe Dr. Omar and other pakar can just continue dulu. Yeah. Terima kasih untuk atas bisu. Okay, I'm going to be touching a bit on STEMI equivalent and STEMI mixer. So, tadi STEMI equivalent, I think you guys have um, touched a bit, uh, quite a lot. So, I just want to add one more. Um, korang pernah dapat tak um, patient yang datang dengan normal ECG but, but uh, with really bad chest pain? Kan? Selalu kan? Selalu kan? Yeah. So, there's this one um, ECG finding that you actually need to know kan? because um, it is um, it is considered as um, hyperkitty. Kan? Hyperkitty. So, the ECG finding is called a new tall T wave V1. And as we all know, T1 tu memang kita akan tengok dekat dia punya um, apa? Uh, T wave dia, it's inverted. Kan? That's a normal one. But when it's inverted, that is actually normal. Yeah. So what you need to see in someone who has a normal ECG with really ch bad chest pain, so you need to see um, the T wave of V1. And if it's inverted, meaning it's upright, bukan ke bawah, and there is something that is boring. And because that is actually a hyperacuity. Provided that it's, that's that's a new ECG like your first ECG lah. So like if you have, if you have, if that's the only ECG that you have, then that's going to be pretty difficult. If you have uh, a baseline ECG, that's something that you can compare with, then it's it's easier. Yeah. So patunya T wave ke bawah kan normal, tapi ni dia ke atas. Kalau ke atas, and then the amplitude amplitude of T one V one two T wave at V one two is bigger than V six. Right? then that is very worrisome right? because there is what we call new tall T wave V1. Right? So what you need to do is you need to do a serial ECG. Kalau misalnya kalau betul, you will be converted into an MR. You can nampak that ST elevation tombstone. Right? So remember, inverted T wave at V1, so upright uh, T wave at V1 and the amplitude um, of V amplitude of T wave at V1 is bigger than V6. Yeah. So someone coming in with um, epigastric pain or chest pain, really bad, normal ECG, tapi tengok eh, T wave dia upright pula. Yeah. Masa tengok dekat dia punya bawah, dekat dia punya V6, eh lagi kecil. So patient might be having an MI. Okay, so tu adalah uh, STEMI equivalent. Kalau STEMI mimics, Always remember, we have a lot of ratios that we use in STEMI mimics and how to differentiate between uh, BR and anterior MI, how to differentiate between pericarditis and BR, and how to differentiate um, apa no? LBBB dengan uh, NMI. And so we have a lot of, oh, dia pasal dengan how to differentiate between an anterior MI dengan LV aneurysm. And so kalau LV MI and LV aneurysm, what, 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 uh, what ratio do we use? We use TQRS ratio. Right? Kalau misalnya kalau um, uh, LBBB, right? modified scabrosa, kita pakai STS ratio. Right? Kalau nak differentiate between um, pericarditis and BR, STS, yeah, STT ratio. Right? Uh, kalau misalnya nak differentiate between BR and Am I? This is scoring system we call as uh, it is called as um, STEMI EKG index. So I need to see at the punya J point uh, at V2. The first two you can think of the punya R wave amplitude, and you have to measure the QTC. Uh, so there's actually a formula there. You must also can you can have a The value is more than twenty three point four. Then that's um, NMI, if it's less than that, it's BR. Okay. 
So sometimes kita nak kita kena pergi kenapa macam pipa tak pecah speed. Ah tunggu why why why. Kan. Masih buat echo ni sama ada ada report inisial. Tu kira lah. Kan. Stem EKG depth ataupun dalam medical faculty itu a satu anterior man. So remember kan um kalau dia dapat yang if if STL vision kan and kalau korang rasa it's an MI then you can use those um, ratios and you can use your best ultrasound to confirm your diagnosis thank you okay thank you Dr. Uma any any input other inputs if no I think you proceed for makan okay thank you